Hi, welcome to Revenue Marketing Television, the CMO Insight Series. I'm your host, Jeff Pedowitz, President and CEO of the Pedowitz Group. Today we have as our guest, Shane Lennon. Uh, Shane has been a 25 year veteran. He has done everything in marketing. He's ran product, he's ran digital, he's ran social, he's um, aligned with sales. He's done a lot of fascinating things and we're so lucky to have him on the program today. Shane, welcome to the show. Jeff, thank you very much. I look forward to it. Great admirer of what your team has done over the years. So glad we finally got to connect. Oh, thank you, sir. Much appreciated. So, you know, we were we were talking um, just before this, and we we're talking about how you know, the conversation for the last twenty years has been aligning sales and marketing. But you have a different perspective, uh, not only aligning sales and marketing, but aligning it back to and with a product focus as well. Sure. So, um, you know, I've, by accident, kind of found this because. Uh, when I've been head of marketing, uh, I think about 80% of the time I've ended up running products, particularly at the startups and even in large organizations. I usually get involved, certainly in the roadmap strategy for the product. Um, and I actually learned it hard in mobile with consumers because it's probably the greatest leveler ever when it comes to customers. You've got one attempt, uh, they better click, download, click, hopefully you start using the product. And, you know, I think some of this, so you, you learn fast about touch points and stuff like that. So when I've worked in the B2B side and SaaS um, particularly, um, I've sat in that room a few times with the product marketing hat on and we will be presenting stuff with sales development and the product team. And all of a sudden I will hear, oh, we're not building that. Uh, we're not selling that. I'm like, wow, disconnect. Uh, and I think what I find many times, particularly with um, technology companies, is people are building out what they think the visionary wants. And, you know, that's great for the first iteration or maybe even the second. But now you're starting to get feedback loops from customers, or hopefully you are. And you find that not all the things in the product are really what customers need. And you go through that. So I often find that um, first and foremost, we just keep adding features for the sake of it. Uh, so you become the jack of all trades, which is not really what you need in any company. I would say, to be honest, under 100 million in revenue, you got to keep a focus. Uh, sure, when you get bigger, yes, different. Um, and often they're building for one user. And my own experience with B2B, and I'll use MarTech as an example, uh, there's three sets of users, I think. There's the CMO who will want the nice uh, dashboard. We call it the lipstick on the pig approach, you know, but, you know, they, they need that stuff because they need to show what's working, what's not. And this is typical with the bigger platforms. I mean, smaller tools. There is the director or VP who owns that operation of that piece of technology or groups of technology who maybe is product marketing or lead gen or whatever, who will be using it on a daily basis, but not actually in there, probably managing others. And then there's the actual users, the marketing managers, who, if you're in a SaaS model, they're the key people because if they're, if they're not using it daily to improve whatever it is they're doing in their job, you fail miserably. And you get to the scenario with a SaaS product where you know, you're having to acquire as many customers as you're losing. And we all know that's not a long-term model. So I've sat in there and more and more um, I've taken a look at product and started prioritizing and built some priority index around, you know, what is the key things that are different for us? And if we didn't have these features, would we really lose customers? And then do we understand what we're building for the three personas? Um, and that gets into customer experience and features and stuff like that. And as you move through that and you work with sales, built out of a customer journey full life cycle, which we've collaborated with sales and other people in the organization. Uh, and that starts to get an alignment of sorts and we get less of the widget of the week needs and we get less of the developer disappearing for three months, building a beautiful piece of technology, which nobody's going to pay for. So, um, you know, very uh, great elaborate answer. Um, you know, you mentioned also in there focusing in and around the customer as you go to market. And as I talk to a lot of marketing executives, I mean, everybody talks about the customer, but a lot of the marketing still is company focused, uh, solution focused, top of the funnel focused. 
um, we're not really seeing that much uh, effort to get customer focused and, and taking a life cycle approach. What's been your experience? Yeah, that I would say the first thing I now do in every single organization is begin a full customer life cycle journey, maybe at a very high level. Um, in some organizations, I'm doing that on, the, on my own and maybe one or two other people, uh, almost skunk works like. Uh, in other organizations, maybe because there's an appetite for it, um, involving more people, you should do a quick iteration of that. Um, you know, it can go from five simple touch points to, you know, 30, 40 very quickly. Um, I do get very involved in the post-sale close aspect of this because too many organizations forget that. Um, I'm a firm believer on the concept of lifetime value as the way to drive success in a business, you know, whether it's SaaS version or different versions. So, you know, uh, land and expand models. So I usually start out out with the management team and, you know, look for champions. Uh, I, I often run into what I call people love the menu, but the second we start serving the appetizer, they push back. So I've got to get a feel for the culture, um, the speed they move at those kind of things. So I usually surface up something. Um, the Probably the first time anybody really sees anything is probably to what we're doing in marketing, which is providing, say, better qualified leads, whatever terms you want to use, broken up maybe by the three persona types. And all of a sudden, certain salespeople are like, wow, this is interesting. Some organizations buy into it immediately. That creates a whole set of other challenges because what happens is it's the inside out lens. It is not a comfortable exercise anywhere I've gone yet, except where the CEO said, just go do it. You have my full support. And that's kind of happened once, <laughs> to be honest. Um, well, it's hard. They say that until, you know, the, the quarterly numbers come in. And then <laughs> if, if the company is behind, no, no, we got to stop spending. We got we have to hold hold up there. You know, we can agree to disagree in a room, but we'll walk out of that room aligned. And, and that's actually been pretty good. Um, and I think I've often said, CEO, look, hopefully you look to me at the beginning of the quarter. And you look to the head of sales at the end of the quarter and you like what you see from both of us and it's aligned. Uh, easier said than done. Um, well, it's, you know, it's hard, you know, and I think that um, it's been a fallacy, right? Technology is supposed to make things easier, make it scale. Yeah. But uh, I'd say over the last 10 years, marketing has gotten harder than it ever, it's ever been, which really requires executives to be, I think, multifaceted and, and, and manage multiple areas at, at once. Yeah, and I'm... I have had, I think maybe where I have a little bit of an advantage at times is having the fingers on the product pie directly or very indirectly. Um, and if I can get that team very focused on what we're needing to build, and um, you know, product to me, I, we hear this term customer experience a lot now. So I would throw product branding all in under that. To be honest, and I think I've seen the first customer experience roles where the CMO and the head of products actually reporting into that person, which is kind of interesting. Um, but um, those things come in under it. I, I try to use the customer journey, the map, whatever it is, to focus people. The other thing I look for, um, and I know I'm having a level of success, is the no list. And this is important in fast growth companies. Our company's going through transformation. Um, and if we can start to build a no list, I know we're starting to get into a good place. Uh, I suppose so the, the biggest challenge. So, well, tell us a little bit more. The no list is that basically a list of things you should stop doing or don't do? Yeah, or put on hold. Yeah. Because limited resources, you know, if you're, if you're double digit growth, uh, you're moving fast. You know, if you're single digit, that's fine. It's a different organization. You're moving fast, there's too many things to do. Uh, you know, using the football sports analogies, you know, you focus on the strengths, not the weaknesses. So, um, you know, there's these shiny objects. So in startups, it's usually the big players and customers can be shiny objects. There's, you know, particularly if you're building market and I tend to use a concept of hero lighthouse strategy, let's get, you know, the, the, the JP Morgans or the Nikes or whatever verticals, because a lot of people follow them, they're great use cases, whatever. 
I have had experience where some of those customers drag the company down a path that ultimately distracts us. And in one case, we almost ran out of cash because of it, because we tilted so much resources towards it. Um, you know, challenge of do we sell to soft sell online? mid-market accounts enterprise. That's a pretty tough business. Even the IBMs and the Oracles of the world outsource parts of that, you know? So, you know, you know they do. We you know IBM have been the best at it, you know, uh, over the years, their account-based top 200 and all that resellers. So, you know, you can't do all those things well. And, and you got to make some decisions there. And that's tough. And that's usually where you really run into the issues. Because what you're saying is we're going to cannibalize some of our ideas and visions, and potentially some of our revenue. Um, and and it, there's a lot of chicken and egg here, and this is why I like the concept of lifetime value, because hopefully over time you can get the picture of what is a good customer for the company and what is a bad customer. Uh, and that's not just revenue. There's other things in there. And if we understand the cost of sale, and cost of sale meaning every cost, you know, the marketing acquisition costs, the soft costs in sales and marketing, and um, the hitting stuff. And, you know, and there's some great examples and models out there of this. Um, David Scott at Matrix. I don't think companies spend enough time looking at lifetime value. I think they, they spend a lot of time looking at acquisition, top of the funnel, getting the next logo. Um, yeah, of course, that's important for long-term growth, but I think... The two other things you have to look at besides how many new customers are we getting, right? How much, how many of those customers are we keeping? And then how much revenue are we growing per customer? And so I yeah. think if you look at that in totality, that kind of then covers the spectrum of, of whether or not you're really delivering value to your customers. I, you know, hopefully I can get to a stage. It will be nice within the first six, nine months where we can begin to, begin to see some pictures of that. You know, what a customer looks like as, you know, by the way, I know there's lots of figures out there to, you know, acquire new customers five times more than expand an existing. Whatever it is, we know it's X more anyway, you know. And um, if I can begin to tell that picture, uh, because usually what I find is I'm ramping that. And there's some organizations who are really good at that. And as we well know, there's some that are terrible at it. And, you know, that's an area then where I can begin to show progress. And all of a sudden I talk about, can we get the client running? The quicker we get them running, uh, the more we're going to see the opportunities. Uh, and then, you know, they become the champions. And you know, at the end of the day, word of mouth is still the biggest number one influence in sales and marketing. So I put a lot of effort into those kind of programs, customer programs, champions. Sometimes people want big results too fast, too quick. If you're a soccer manager in England at the moment, if you don't win the Premier League in the first two seasons, you're fired, you know? So um, I, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and and actually, that's a classic example how um, ultimately this is all about culture and people. And that's where I've landed in the last maybe 10 years. Um, you know, process is process. We can do agile, hybrids, all this kind of stuff. And technology is technology. And I've worked with CTOs who can build anything, integrate anything. Um, but it is the people aspect. And having run a couple of millennial teams, which I love, so I'm a huge fan. Millennials has worked very well for me. Um, the stuff that works well with the millennials does not necessarily work well with my peers and boomers. Uh, and I think that's, I personally think that's corporate America's biggest challenge going forward is how do you bring that? And particularly now millennials are becoming CMOs and C-suites. They have a different approach. Uh, there's things they can improve, um, but they are good on execution, the right ones. Um, so it is the people aspect. And uh, I've often said jokingly when I'm looking at transformation, I'll talk to CEO and we go through, we're ready, we're going to do this. And, you know, I think I see a lot of digital lipstick as against transformation. I said, good. I said, so what if we have to head, get rid of your head of sales? Oh, hold on a second. Well, I said, what if transformation means we're going to go to a total soft sell online model and your head of sales is an enterprise builder and that's not the way we're going to go? And there's a realization that, you know, transformation is really around doing business probably differently. Uh, lots of companies can do it in the back end, uh, but I think more and more where it's really a hit now is in the front end with the customers. You know, the experience that you have with your iPhone or your game machine 
Um, you want that same experience when you walk up and said, like, you know, the network engineer that plays Doom and whatever else and has 50 apps doesn't suddenly want to become, you know, the dope in front of a terrible UI experience in shell scripts all the time when he walks into work or she does or whatever. So there's a lot of that going on. And I think that picture around LTV and customer journey is critical. Um, and I've had a lot of challenge there. And I would say... You know, it's got me into trouble um, because maybe it doesn't play well. But then I realize, you know, I am an early adopter. I suppose I am somewhat of a disruptor. Um, and that's hopefully why you brought me on. Uh, and if you didn't, we find that out pretty quickly. And, you know, when I do consulting work, I usually find that by day 90, you know, when you're working full time, you hit that usually towards the end of year one. And, um, I think that's a big challenge for those of us who like to push um, as against those maybe who are, I'm not going to say more status quo, but are slower moving. And um, so for me, you know, there's certain environments it works, um, you know, and I would advise more, let's say the single digit, but the double digit is about, it, you know, the LTV. Uh, Shane, thank you so much for all your great insights today. Um, great career. Keep up the bike racing. That's it. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to retire to rugby ball, I think. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll cheer for Manu. You know, that, that's a, it's, a, it's a temporary situation, right? They'll be right back on top. But uh, thanks again for being on the program today. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.